Hey everyone, Correct Jeans here for Lockpickers United, and we're going to do a breakdown of the Miwa PR. The Miwa PR is a Japanese lock made by the Miwa Manufacturer Company, and it's a bit of a weird lock because it has it's full of rotating wafers on these weird weak springs that interact with a sidebar at the bottom, and it's full of false gates and fun things. So in order to kind of show you what's going on with all that, let's go ahead and take it apart. As I do this, um, one thing I will mention is this is, I think, one of the most probably fun and frustrating locks that I've ever had to learn. This lock has elements of it that are rather unique in that much of its difficulty comes from the inability to find the binders and inability to actually navigate the lock. It's compared to other similar locks, which I'll show you in a minute. The act of navigating its false gates is not quite as difficult. In fact, the serrations and false gates don't pose a huge issue in comparison with the fact that the lock is just overall very hard to move around in. And um, hopefully a little bit later, I'll be able to give you a good idea of why that is the case. All right, so these screws are very small. So I need to use a very small screwdriver. So this whole little thing kind of pops off. It's a little bit annoying to put back together if you, you know, lose it. So there it is. So this lock actually gives a very good view of how the sidebar is working. So you can see looking at the back of the lock here, here is the sidebar right there. And you can see the spring in the rear. And it's sitting in this groove inside the lock. In order for the lock to open, you can, the key is not always all the way in. You can see that that sidebar is preventing rotation. Key goes all the way in. You can see as I turn it, that sidebar recedes. So the locking mechanism requires that sidebar to recede. And in order for the sidebar to recede, there needs to be nothing blocking it from doing that. And what blocks the sidebar from receding is these wafers. You can see that there are 11 of them and they are all lined up at their true gates at the moment. So let's get these springs out before I lose them. But of course, as you take the key out, those gates are no longer aligned. The sidebar cannot recede because it's being blocked. Key goes back in, they're all lined up. Now you can see that there are, there are, there's a lot more to these wafers than just true gates and then nothing else. There is a lot of texture going on here. And so let's take a look at some of this. Let me actually zoom in a little bit. Here we go. So let's get a getting a good look at these here. You can see that we have our true gate, but also we have these serrations like these here. Additionally, on some of these, you can see that it has like this little step in front of it. And this step is actually surprisingly annoying. It doesn't block you from moving into the true gate. However, if you are stuck in a false gate or a serration on another wafer and you are, this wafer is set, the fact that this is stepped down means that as you rotate back enough to get over these serrations, this wafer is just going to drop out of its gate and you have to go back and pick it. And that's easier said than done because the issue becomes, you know, having to find it and pick it. And that's pretty hard. So you have the serrations, you have the steps, and then you also have false gates. And these, you can see a couple right here. These are false gates. So these are just the same size as the true gate, except they are shallower too shallow to allow a sidebar to fully recede. So one thing about this lock is while there is a lot of serrations and false gates, it is, and it is very difficult to get around those. I do not consider that the hardest part of this lock. I consider the hardest part of this lock, not oversetting things and being able to actually find and lift things to the max height. So if you look at the key, you can see that while there are 11 wafers, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cuts. Oh, oh no, nothing, something's missing. Well, that's because I believe it's right here. You can see on here that there is one wafer that is max lift. If I can find it. Yeah, it's this guy right here. So you can see that before the key's fully in, it's not even on a cut right now, it's lined up. And that's because this wafer corresponds to having no cut on the key. And that is honestly just a very annoying thing to work with because in this lock in particular, and in most 
PRs, you're going to find this type of bidding on a lot of them. You end up with these dimples that are very low cut, and then you have a cut after it that just doesn't show up on the key because you have to pick it all the way. It needs to be completely flush. And part of the problem is that you need to be able to find it, but inside this keyway, you have all these profile wafers. The keyway feels like this. It's not a smooth thing. So that's where a lot of the difficulty with the sock comes in. And then in a minute, I'll show you how we try to deal with that using uh, by finding the clear areas and getting picks in there. All right, so this is the base model for the Miwa PR. It has 11 wafers. Each one has one true gate. Let's go ahead and bring in some other stuff for comparison. Yeah, you can also see back here the springs and the other side of the wafers. This, this is the axis that it's rotating on. So it rotates up here and then the gates move on the bottom. All right, so here I have another Miwa, oh, another Miwa PR. However, you can see one distinct difference here. You can see that in the middle, there is this big spacer piece. And if you count these, there are in fact only 10 wafers. Additionally, wafers number three and four on this, as I go through it, you can see that three there and four there both have two true gates. And those are actually corresponding to pretty low cuts on the key. So the, the way that they do master keying in this lock tends to involve removing one wafer, adding true gates, and those true gates tend to be on the low cuts. And this actually tends to make the lock significantly more forgiving to pick because it means that when you overset these low cuts, you still have another gate to get to. And that makes a very big difference because probably 90% of the failed picks that I have on a lock like this have to do with me accidentally oversetting something. It is super, super easy to accidentally overset a low cut in the front when you're trying to get a high cut behind it. I cannot emphasize that enough. All right, the next variation we have um, is this one's branded under Tostum, but it is the Miwa PS, which is a short version of the lock. This one has a spacer in the back. I don't know if there is an eight wafer version of this lock, but this one is seven wafers. It has no master keying in it. And it's basically the exact same lock, except the key is shorter. There's really not a whole lot to say about that. And then lastly, we have something that's a bit of an outlier. This is not the same, well, do not come, oh no, I'm losing a spring. Okay, I'll deal with that later. This is not the same exact thing. This in fact has a different keyway, a different type of key. This is the Miwa U9, but it has a very similar concept where it has wafers that are rotating on a, an axis here, and the gates on this top here are interacting with the key. Um, the main difference here is this one doesn't have as many serrations, and, and the gates in this lock are actually extremely deadly. The hardest part about picking the Miwa U9 is getting out of the gates and knowing that you are definitely going to be dropping things over and over and over again as you get through these gates in this lock. Um, the U9 is, is very brutal um, when it comes to getting out of the false gates. Compared to the PR, the PR, not as much an issue with that. There's serrations everywhere. The false gates aren't quite as deep. doesn't cause a huge issue. For the U9, wow, the gates, the gates are horrible. Uh, that's definitely the challenge. So now that I've given you a good look at what's going on in the PR, I'm going to go ahead and switch views to show you how we pick it. So here we are looking through the back of the keyway. I have the camera lined up so that you can see through this side of the lock all the way through to the front. Um, and the white areas are where you're seeing reflection from a white piece of paper on the other end. First thing I wanna show here is the movable elements. So the main elements, the ones that are interacting with the face of the key, look like this. They're gonna move up and down, but not quite up and down. It's not like a dimple lock where you're kinda of getting this pin that's moving up and down. It moves sort of diagonally. And by the time you get near the end of its movement, and it's, you know, it's locking into false gates and serrations, you end up with, if you're trying to say set something that doesn't have a cut on the key, it's max lift, then you might get, end up caught in a serration or a false gate where it's sitting like this. And you need to pick it. And it's very hard to find it. And in my opinion, that's, I think, the hardest thing about picking this lock, is being able to find the binders that are sitting up there like this. It takes the longest amount of time. I've spent 20 to 30 minutes just looking for one of these things because you'll go through the whole lock, there's nothing binding, and you just can't find it. So there are these movable elements. There's also, there's also, there we go. 
you can see that side element there that I'm pushing in. So that's what interacts with the dimples on the side. And those are a bit easier to access for the most part. So we have three angles of attack. So give me a second and I will get my pick in from the other side and I'll show you how we're going to be attacking this lock with three different picks. All right, so first angle attack is going to be from the bottom of the keyway. I apologize for any clumsiness. I'm kind of holding this from the other side of the lock. Um, and you can see first off that it is very, very easy to overset things in this lock. I am just, I just have this pick flat against the bottom here. And even doing that kind of moves this wafer up and down. And so you need to be very careful about how you're navigating this lock. It is super, super easy to set something in the back and then end up oversetting something in the front. And in fact, when you, when it comes to getting things in the gates at the very beginning, um, my strategy involves using this hook. And you can see how this wafer kind of extends a little bit into the keyway on the right side there. And I'm just going to kind of press in. And that's what I'll use to get everything into their first gates. The main purpose of using this hook, however, is to pick those side nubs. So you can see there. And it's to pick those side nubs with the way that gives the best feedback and does not interact with the others. So the next method is to pick instead, sorry for the shaking, I'm very zoomed in. So, and pick instead from this stripe of light on the left here. Um, that's going to be our next area of clear travel that we're going to exploit. All right, so now we have the flag in in this next venue. And you can see that we can navigate through the keyway a little awkwardly because if I'm holding it. But you can see I can get up through here without really moving the wafer much at all. And the, this is the amount of movement that is acceptable. There's no gate that's going to be so constrained that this amount of movement oversets it. Additionally, the leverage on the bottom here allows us to lift just like this. And with our range of motion, we can get about this high. You can see that this flag barely fits in the keyway. It's, you know, straight up and down here. It's just about hitting the top. But because these wafers move diagonally, the issue becomes that you need a flag. Yeah, it's hard to do. You need a flag that is able to reach that diagonal amount. And that's not possible if you're picking from this direction. You can't have something that both fits and is able to pick something that needs to be completely flush with the top. This is as far as you can go without having to push in like that. But as soon as you do this, you're going to overset something. So you're not allowed to do this. You're going to, especially if you have no idea what the bidding is in the lock, this is going to get you absolutely nowhere. So we need another pick. So here we have this is our last angle of attack. You can see that we have a similar amount of movement moving under the wafers. And additionally, we have the ability to reach the top. Now the reason that the whole thing is not picked in this way, there's a couple of them. The first is that the side wafers get in the way a little bit. They make it a little awkward to navigate through. Additionally, the leverage from this direction is bad. You can see that I don't really have a whole lot of leverage on. I'm basically just using the force of the shaft itself to push right now, which is not ideal. It's hard to get good feedback when you have to push like that. Additionally, um, it's a little harder to get under things. You don't necessarily have the same amount of maneuverability as a smaller one. So being able to figure out whether something is jiggly or uh, stiff, you know, because when you move under something, it lifts it a little bit like this. So generally you need to move on and off of it like this in order to figure out if something's binding or not. And that's just a little bit more awkward to do with this pick. So most of the navigation that is done in this lock while picking it is done with the smaller one from the inside. So those are the three different angles that you need to be able to pick this. The main things to keep in mind are that you are able to, one, move throughout the keyway without disturbing the wafers because otherwise you cannot pick anything in the back without oversetting things in the front. And almost all biddings in the non-mastered versions of this lock are going to have very low cuts somewhere in the front and a max lift cut somewhere in the middle or the back. And so you're going to get basically nowhere if you cannot navigate this lock without moving a thing. Unfortunately, you also need to be able to do the maximum lift range while at the same time navigating without lifting anything. And that means being able to, that means being able to do exactly that. You can theoretically do it with just this flag here. However, I've spent a lot of time trying to, you know, working on picking these locks, and it's a lot, it's very awkward to try to pick the whole thing like this. It's much more 
time effective, much better feedback if you use something a little bit smaller with, with a thinner shaft in particular. The thick shaft on this is part of the reason it's annoying. Something a little smaller with a little bit of a thinner shaft is going to make you a little bit more maneuverable with the lock. You're going to have a much better time getting everything you know through its first few gates. And then you can transition to using something like this to search for the final binders that are up at the top. So that's, that's basically the method that I use for doing this. So that's it for the MIWA PR and its variations. I'll see you all again on Sling Saturday where we're going to go ahead and pick this 11 wafer version of the lock. Until then.